Thank you everybody for jumping on today. We're just gonna wait just a couple more moments for everybody to join onto this live class before we begin today. Okay, so it looks like we have just about everybody on the live class here today. Hello everybody and welcome to our live class. We're very excited to have you here and looking forward to an awesome lecture today. My name is Anthony and I'll be your host for today. I'm joined on the line by Dr. Sheila Dean, the co-founder of the Integrative and Functional Nutrition Academy, who will be conducting most of the presentation today. I'll pass it off to her momentarily to kick off the presentation on today's topic, an introduction to integrative and functional nutrition. But before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. I've muted everybody by default. And secondly, if you have any questions during the course of the live class, please submit them in the chat panel. The questions all come to me as the host and I'll be conducting a live Q&A with our presenter at the end of the presentation. With that said, I'd like to pass it off to Dr. Sheila Dean to start the presentation. Hey everybody, so wonderful to be here. Thank you for joining me and welcome to my presentation entitled an, inter an introduction to integrative and functional nutrition. Curious minds want to know. I'm Dr. Sheila Dean, co-founder of the Integrative and Functional Nutrition Academy, and I'm very, very happy to be here with all of you and my friends at Rupa Health. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm just going to move my um, video over here so that I can see my screen. All right. So Okay, those are my disclosures, as you know. Okay, so my learning objectives with you today are to define and describe the principles of integrative and functional medicine and nutrition. We're going to uh, identify the IFNA stain root, root cause analysis model. And we're going to demonstrate an integrative and functional approach to a small case study. So, uh, I just want to start by bringing your to your attention the World Health Organization's global report on traditional and complementary medicine in 2019, where the authors noted that traditional and complementary medicine uh, is an important and often understated health resource with many applications, especially in the prevention and management of lifestyle related chronic diseases. Given the unique health challenges of the 21st century, uh, traditional and complementary medicine is undergoing a revival. And interestingly, uh, a survey uh, was conducted, 5,164 Academy members were surveyed. Uh, this is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And the top conditions seen in this um, survey included GI, allergies, obesity, fatigue, heart disease, hypertension, immune disorders, depression, anxiety, stress, chronic pain, type one, type two, diabetes, uh, where uh, they identified that despite the strong interest in integrative and functional nutrition, there was still major gaps in the nutrition professional's knowledge. So the greater challenge still continues to be that dietitians, nutrition professionals, uh, various professionals are inadequately trained along with a lack of mentorship in the area of integrative uh, nutrition. So uh, what do we mean exactly by integrative? Well, integrative is defined as the integration of multiple modalities of healing and ther uh, therapies, including diet, food, nutrition, supplements, exercise, right? So movement, including yoga or Qigong, meditation, uh, total, uh, I mean, excuse me, traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, massage, and even, and even pharmaceuticals, right? So we, we include that. And uh, functional nutrition then focuses on how whole foods and key nutrients modulate the health and process of healing, right? So nutrition is therapeutic and the nutrition professional is the ultimate healthcare professional licensed to provide that medical nutrition therapy or MNT, right? So 
Nutrition is the cornerstone of functional medicine. Nutrition is prevention oriented, right? Uh, nutrition is therapeutic, right? And nutrients and foods are powerful, multi-targeted biological response modifiers. So as an example, iodine, think about iodine, think about vitamin D receptors that exist in each of the many trillions of cells in your body and regulate cellular function, right? Magnesium alone is involved in like two thirds of the enzymes involved in detoxification. So integrative and functional nutrition defined in a nutshell is the advanced practice of applying a personalized nutrition care process with the goal of promoting health and preventing diet and lifestyle related diseases using the principles and concepts of integrative and functional medicine. So what you see here is that when a patient is diagnosed with an illness, it's not really the starting point, right? So disease is a process that may not even be discovered until decades after the initial biochemical alterations, right? So the patient's diagnosis is really just the tip of the iceberg, as you see here in this illustration. So as functional nutrition practitioners, we're trying to understand the underlying causes, right? The root causes, which means that we need to take a personalized approach, right? So a personalized approach is obviously a major component of functional nutrition to try to understand the root cause of chronic disease, uh, to reestablish organ reserve and vitality, and of course, balance essential core areas of health which begs the question, what are those core areas? So here you see those core systems, right? All sort of interconnected. And the metaphor of the iceberg is seen here again, where the diagnosis is really just the tip of the iceberg. So this patient might come to you with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia or irritable bowel or anxiety, uh, PMS, chronic pain, acne, maybe they're overweight. Uh, in fact, it was interesting that a functional medicine landmark study reported that practitioners reported that most of their patients did come to them with complex chronic disorders, and that up to 50% of their patients report six or more diagnoses. So when you're working on uh, a patient, when you're working up a patient, you're gonna get a lot of information. And we really need to be like health detectives, right? And you're going to need some type of structured process. So the STAIN uh, acronym is a really nice way to organize your thought process and approach to what might be the possible root cause or causes of your patient's condition to make sure that you are covering all of your bases. So you're not missing a big chunk of a possible root cause. And for each physiological system, answers to the questions of what those root causes are and what's lacking for optimal function help to guide both your diagnosis and obviously your therapy, right? Because the aim is to restore balance in each system by removing as many obstacles or impediments to health, and then providing the ingredients, so to speak, right, needed for optimal function. So a lot of this can be gleaned from your patient's history and the labs that help to refine that clinical approach. So let me just take a moment to review these root causes that can stain a person's health, okay? So S for stress. So obviously this can be physical and psychological. So we know that physical stress can produce alterations in tissue pH. So a person could be such that a person could be in this more acid loaded state. And this has been associated with all sorts of chronic disease, particularly osteoporosis. So acid base balance was the topic of my doctoral dissertation years ago. And when I was doing my literature review, I was shocked to see how many papers there were on the subject. And of course, there are psychological stressors, such as work-related stress, marital stress, financial stress, children, taking care of elderly parents, right? So all kinds of things. Now, T for toxins. 
So we're not just talking about obvious toxins like cigarette smoke or even you know, lead poisoning, but also biological or endogenous toxins, elemental toxins like mercury or synthetic toxins, pollutants, glyphosate, bisphenol A, right? The list, the list just goes on and on. And A for adverse food reactions, but not just food, right? Also, they could, it could be mold, it could be dust, it could be animal products, it could be pollen, it could be chemicals, right? So I for infections, right? So bacterial, of course, parasitic, fungal, and we, you know, we know about viral infection, right? Of course. And then N for nutritional imbalances. So obviously a poor diet, but also, guys, don't forget, you can, you can have what's called drug-induced Nutrition um, imbalances, uh, a, a nutrition imbalance could be due to something called a SNP. A SNP stands for a single nucleotide polymorphism that refers to a genetic variant, right? Sometimes um, we refer to them as mutations. Um, so you can have two people come to you with gut symptoms, right? Say they come to you and they present with GI distress. And, you know, for one patient, it's just about a poor diet, maybe low fiber, and you work with them, you clean up the diet, and they feel great, they're fine. But with another person with very similar symptoms, you may find that there's subclinical infection going on, and it's and you, you're going to really need to run some labs to get to the bottom of it. And so it's going to be important that we try to be able to uncover these things. So doing a stain root cause analysis is gonna help you deliver personalized nutrition. In the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in this 2020 article, the authors state personalized nutrition refers to individual specific information founded in evidence-based science to promote dietary behavior change that may result in measurable health benefits. Personalized nutrition technologies, which include the omics approaches, may offer the potential to improve specificity of nutrition care through assessment of molecular level data, such as the genes or the microbiome, in order to determine the course for nutrition intervention. So what are the key elements of an integrative and functional nutrition approach? Okay, so I think we're all starting to become very familiar with the gut-brain microbiome access and connection. Um, learning how to implement and guide the patient with the 5R model of healing, right? Remove, replace, repair, repopulate, and rebalance is ultimately going to impact the gut immune system and impact brain chemical function. And so fortunately, there are a number of studies available on the topic of the gut uh, brain microbiome for your review. So another key element in the integrative and functional nutrition approach is using a, and I'm sure you've heard this by now, a food as medicine approach, including therapeutic elimination diets, but also understanding how to recommend the responsible use of dietary supplements, even if it's just a multivitamin. Uh, here you see just three of many articles that have been published on dietary supplements for the prevention and treatment of COVID. Uh, because of their immunomodulatory, antioxidative, and antimicrobial properties. And I'm sure many of us have already had patients ask you about what supplements might be best to take during the COVID pandemic. So this is a big one, right? So IFN training will definitely also include an expanded understanding of not just conventional, but also functional biomarkers, regardless of who's ordering the lab. So whether you are ordering the lab uh, as a functional nutrition professional, a dietitian, uh, you know, or if you're working with a physician, regardless of who's ordering the lab, whether you have ordering privileges or not, lab analysis is an extremely important component of IFN or integrative and functional nutrition. Particularly, uh, nutrigenomic testing or nutrigenetic testing, uh, now that we're entering this era of nutrigenetic testing, that helps us to understand the specific needs for nutrients based on, you know, the patient's unique genetics. And of course, of course, the knowledge of mind-body practices, including mindfulness-based therapies, meditative movement therapies, such as yoga, Qigong, guided imagery, you know, and other practices. It's, it's 
really such an important element of integrative, the integrative and functional nutrition approach. So what I'm gonna show you today is not a complete and comprehensive functional nutrition workup, but it's a snapshot of how you might get started using a functional nutrition approach. So in this case, uh, our patient was a 50 year old woman named Felicia, okay? And Felicia presented with a variety of concerns as you can see here, but her chief concern was fibromyalgia. All right, so we know that fibromyalgia is a clinical entity characterized by the combination of widespread pain and other symptoms, including fatigue, anxiety, sleep problems, cognitive and GI disturbances. Uh, while there is an ongoing controversy over the definition and diagnostic criteria of fibromyalgia, we know that there seems to be uh, a genetic predisposition triggered by environmental factors which continue to be investigated. But ultimately, fibromyalgia is an impaired stress response system, okay, that leads to the dysregulation of the nociceptive system and the appearance of clinical symptoms. So where the patient is in terms of their readiness to change, what their financial resources are, how motivated they are to incorporate your recommendations, how ready and willing they are to run the labs. Uh, this is extremely important in my opinion to, to have some kind of an assessment on, right? So you know that the science of functional medicine is what we learn in our training, but the art of functional medicine comes with time and experience. And you know sometimes uh, we make mistakes and we learn from those. So I think having some kind of an assessment to get an, an idea of where the patient's at before they come in is really important because you can have the greatest program ready to discuss with your patient. But if your patients, you know, checks off ones and twos, where which is not willing to barely willing, um, you're probably going to take a much more conservative approach when you're working with the patient. Now there are going to be times where your patient checks off fives, right? I've had that happen, and they come in and suddenly they're feeling a little overwhelmed. So you're gonna to have to be able to work with your patient, read your patient, really develop a rapport with the patient to understand where they're at. I especially find this important when it comes to the question of nutritional supplements and labs. You know, we have this wonderful plan, like I said, ready for our patient. And we um, don't wanna just throw everything at the patient if they're telling us ahead of time that they're, you know, wanting to move slowly. So something to keep in mind. Um, critical thinking, extremely important to this process with the plethora of research coming out on personalized medicine, we see that this one size fits all approach is out and an integrative and functional nutrition or lifestyle medicine uh, is now in. So to manage the complexity that's just inherent in this approach, a really good place to start is with this simple approach uh, which is to me kind of like the hammer of your toolkit, right? To simply ask two very important questions, which to me is the foundation of what functional medicine is really all about, uh, which is what does this person require to improve function in order to support health and healing, right? So you're asking the question, what needs to go in what needs to come in? So is it some type of healing food plan, stress management, restorative sleep, dietary supplements, movement therapy, light, love? And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be the one to address all of these issues. You can obviously refer out, but at some point, some of these questions are going to have to be addressed. And on the other side of this, this uh, balance, is what does this person need to remove in order to improve function in order to support health and healing? So what needs to come out, right? So what are those things that need to come in? And what are those things that we need to take out of their life? And that STAIN acronym is really helpful in trying to determine what might need to come out. Are there toxins, adverse food reactions, infection, right? So. So that is uh, a way to frame how you can, uh, to create a framework um, for your assessment. And 
here we have the uh, IFNA nutrition care plan process. What you're seeing here is a funnel-like illustration that starts with crafting together the assessment that includes uh, an expanded dietary analysis, identifying root causes, as I just mentioned, and then identifying system imbalances, and then assessing all of that data while keeping in mind your patient's unique genetic needs in the backdrop to ultimately come up with the nutrition care plan. Right, so Okay, so in this particular case, um, in Felicia's case, when you're when you go and, and you're doing that assessment and you're and you're starting with let's say food, what foods need to come in, what foods need to come out. So based on your nutrition assessment findings, in Felicia's case, we might start with an initial food plan, uh, which could be a whole food plant based approach, right? Where we're starting with uh, removing uh, offending food chemicals, um, such as MSG or aspartame. And then you've got the addition of detoxification supportive foods, such as greens and herbs and spices. And there's all sorts of um, research that I'm constantly coming across. I get all kinds of, I have PubMed set up so that I get notifications um, for certain types of research. And there's always all kinds of amazing research coming out every day. Uh, really a, as a testament to the power of food as medicine. Uh, here, I'll just read you a small portion of this, as, this um, abstract where they talk about uh, the analysis of the literature has shown that the role of dietary supplements remains controversial, although clinical trials with vitamin D, magnesium, iron, probiotics, supplementation showing promising results. With regard to dietary interventions, the administration of olive oil, the replacement diet with ancient grains, low calorie diets, the low FODMAPs diet, the gluten-free diet, the MSG and aspartame free diet, vegetarian diet, as well as the Mediterranean diet all appear to be effective in reducing fibromyalgia symptoms, right? These results may suggest that weight loss together with psychosomatic component of the disease should be taken into account, right? So just a little bit of um, research here to back up some of what we're discussing. And in a phase two, if, if you are continuing to work with this patient, you know, um, based on what the patient comes back and tells you, you may need to step up to an elimination diet where we're now eliminating certain um, food antigens, including wheat. Um, and of course, others, uh, other food antigens as determined by the patient's food and symptom journals. All right, so, um, Supplements, right? So we want to ask the question about supplements. Is the patient open to taking dietary supplements or is the patient already taking dietary supplements? And if so, uh, do we need to evaluate? Do we need to reevaluate, right? Asking the question, is the patient taking any medications? Uh, because we want to assess any drug nutrient interactions, drug herbal interactions, right? And uh, based on the patient's clinical presentation then and symptomology, and, and of course the labs, the labs, we're gonna prioritize our dietary supplement recommendations, right? So for example, some of them might include in Felicia's case, some vitamin D, some magnesium, SAMe, SAMe is uh, S adenosyl methionine, that's the universal methyl donor. Very, very important if your patient has a COMT SNP, which I can talk a little bit more about, probiotics and adaptogens, anti-inflammatory medical foods, right? There's a variety of different supplements that you can recommend. And uh, this particular systematic review offers a feasible means for synthesizing the evidence specific to herbs and dietary supplements on fibromyalgia, which could reveal some new and novel research directions as well as advancing current management approaches to the treatment of fibromyalgia. Labs. Okay, this is a big one. Um, there, you know, are a lot of people that still um, that, that need a lot of training on labs. But the thing is that um, uh, there's so many different labs, and uh, you know, you might want to start with maybe just conventional labs. In this particular case with Felicia, we would start with a, just a CMP, a comprehensive metabolic profile, and a CBC with a differential, but interpreted with a functional lens, right? So looking for optimal, not just um, acceptable 
Um, and some additional biomarkers to take into account might be things like CRP, which is, as you know, a marker of systemic inflammation, their SED rate, looking at their vitamin D status, their red blood cell magnesium status, their homocysteine status, MTHFR, which is um, much, much more common these days. And gosh, you can run an MTHFR just through LabCorp and Quest. You don't even have to go through you know, a special uh, lab anymore for that. Um, functional labs. In this particular case, with uh, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, I'm thinking it about something called an organic acids panel, right? Uh, metabolomics is just a, a proprietary panel from a, a, um, a one particular lab, but an organic acids panel is definitely something you might want to look at because it's a view into the body's cellular metabolic processes, right? Organic, what are organic acids? Organic acids are the metabolic intermediates that are produced in pathways of central energy production, right? Think about the Krebs cycle, right? Remember when we learned about the Krebs cycle way back in our training and all when, when, the, when, the, um, when you're going from one substrate to another, you're producing these organic acids. And this, is, this can be detected in the urine, right? And uh, these, these intermediates are produced uh, not just as a part of center, uh, central energy production, but as part of detoxification, uh, neurotransmitter breakdown, intestinal microbial activity, right? So accumulation, especially marked accumulation of certain specific organic acids detected in the urine. And these labs can detect these things with incredible precision, right? This trigger, this often signals a, some kind of block or a metabolic inhibition, right? When you have high levels of a particular organic acid, right? When, they're, when it's not flowing into the next substrate. So that block could be due to what? A nutrient deficiency, or, or it could be an inherited enzyme deficit or a toxic buildup or even a drug effect, right? So there's a variety of things to take into account. In Felicia's case, we might want to run a stool analysis because of her IBS, a constipation, IBS, a constipation based IBS. Um, or we might want to run an adrenal stress index lab. So there's a bunch of different possibilities, and you know, you have to get organized about that. One of the things that I really uh, want to relay about lab testing is that it can get confusing to know which labs to choose that's right for your patients. There's a lot of labs out there and they're all basically telling you that they are the best ones, right? So one of the things that I really like about Rupa Health is that they're not biased towards one lab or another, right? The scientific approach, right? So that being, uh, and being that so many of these labs offer these panels and they're all so amazing and they're so similar uh, that they, they, Rupa Health helps put together resources to help you you choose the best option for your patient, which is really important when you're trying to offer a customized, individualized care to your patient. So super, super helpful um, when you're trying to figure this out. So by all means, check it out. You know, there's a bunch of video tutorials and guides in their support center. I have yet to go through them all um, and I'm learning every day. And uh, you really want to take some time to go through that and have that at your disposal. You guys, anything, any of these tools, um, that you can pick up, you know, these free kind of tools and resources, take advantage of this. Uh, you'll be amazed by how after a year and two years and three years, how, how all of this can really help you um, really um, expand your understanding and knowledge and, and you can really quickly learn so much. So going back to the IFNA nutrition care plan process, now we're looking at lifestyle and there's a whole menu of options to explore, to find the practice or practices that are best suited to the patient. So relaxation therapies, aqua therapy, right? But which by the way, I, I've done, which is amazing. Um, Qigong, yoga, guided imagery, affirmations, mindfulness, prayer, meditation, all of these different things to, to take into consideration. And if you don't feel like you're the expert, then don't try to be, refer it out. I'm sure there are other healthcare professionals who would really like the opportunity to explore some of these um, mind uh, body practices with the patient. And here are some um, papers for your perusal. 
And then, as I said, resources, referrals. Um, in this case, um, we referred uh, Felicia to a mobile app for chronic pain, but there's all kinds of support groups and variety of referrals, acupuncture, cognitive behavioral therapy, neuromuscular therapy, okay? So look at this really, take, just think about how comprehensive this is, uh, this approach is, where we're not only looking at what the patient needs in terms of their diet, but we're doing that stain uh, root cause analysis, asking the questions, what need to go in, what need to come out, uh, running those labs, you, to basically figure out what they need. You can't guess, you have to test, right? Don't guess, just test. That way you know what supplements and what um, uh, uh, foods you, know, you can recommend to make this uh, an, a, a personalized approach. And so in summary, uh, the integrative and functional nutrition care process utilizes an integrative and functional approach to nutrition assessment. Again, seeks to identify root causes creating, that are creating dysfunction or disease, applies critical thinking to understand system imbalances and pattern recognition, designs a personalized nutrition care plan to promote optimal health, healing, resistance, and well-being, collaborates with conventional and integrative and functional medicine and or nutrition healthcare providers. Um, Dr. Jeff Bland, who is a mentor to many, many, including myself, a really a pioneer and, and what many, who many consider the father of functional medicine said, the 21st century has already demonstrated itself to be an era of change for medicine and science. There's a new openness to ideas, to a shift in perspectives, to a redefinition of evidence and the many ways it can be gathered. It's a fertile time on many fronts, including an expanded reach for a systems biology formalism and the functional medicine movement. So why get integrative and functional nutrition training to begin with? I think what you'll find with time and training is that you're going to start to feel an incredible sense of personal satisfaction, revitalizing your career, rediscovering your passion, acquiring the knowledge, the skills, the tools in integrative and functional nutrition, truly making you one of the most sought after nutrition professionals in a very, very swiftly growing competitive marketplace, right? Becoming like a nutrition sleuth and learning how to identify root causes and system imbalances in chronic diseases. So for me personally, I saw an immediate increase in my patient volume and income. And I also wanted to make you aware of the survey that was conducted in which over 7,000 functional medicine clinicians were surveyed and about, uh, I think 1,016 responded. And amongst their findings was this very interesting statistic that for non-physicians, advanced integrative and functional nutrition training a training equated to a 33% income boost, which really demonstrates, guys, that this approach is not only changing the landscape of the health of healthcare, but it's also being driven by consumer demand. Speaking of consumer demand, I don't know where the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics got this statistic from, but I thought it was really interesting that in an email they sent out to dietitians for their upcoming annual food and nutrition event, they say on this slide that RDN's council, 1.5 billion contact, uh, have a uh, 1.5 billion contact with clients and patients per year. That's a lot. <laughs> Clearly the need is there and we have to be ready and armed with this important information so that we can best serve our patients. We, we definitely have our work cut out for us, don't we? So why choose IFNA? I'm just gonna take a couple of quick minutes to tell you a little bit about IFNA training or online training. Again, here you see the stain slide. We went through this, we went through each of the components to get a better understanding of a root cause analysis to help you organize your patient workup. 
And um, because uh, if the training helps to deliver ba better patient outcomes and patient care, right, becoming proficient in a whole body system approach, the root cause analysis, therapeutic elimination diets and food plans, uh, we have a variety of lab, um, modules, two dedicated modules on labs alone. And of course, we discuss um, labs and supplements and diet throughout, you know, sprinkle throughout all the modules, including mind body modalities. So you put it all together using the IFNA nutrition care plan model, as I mentioned before, where we take uh, food and supplements, labs, lifestyle, and resources and referrals all into consideration. Okay, and so a list of the modules and their descriptions of all the, of, the tr of everything is um, located right on the website, right here. And here you see a list of the topics and the faculty members presenting for each of the modules in track one. We've got an amazing um, lineup and you can go to the website to take um, a closer look at the variety of um, topics covered, including um, labs and functional blood chemistry interpretation okay, for conventional labs, but also an entire module dedicated to functional diagnostic labs. Um, and then we wrap it up with a conversation on dietary supplements there. But that's just track one. Track two gets into all the various um, systems um, and uh, you know, gut-related disorders, brain disorders, cardiometabolic, obesity, detox, cancer, adrenal, thyroid, hormone, mitochondropathy. I mean, there's, there's a lot. And then of course, track three, we now get into more advanced topics, including advanced culinary medicine, the nutrition focused physical, an advanced conversation about nutraceuticals, and another uh, module completely dedicated to labs, nutrigenomics, nutrigenetics, um, <clears throat> and then uh, really an entire module dedicated to um, growing your own practice. Track four is all about the various therapeutic elimination diets that there's so much confusion about. And you can see we've got a, a, an incredible lineup here as well. We talk about um, the ketogenic diet and the FODMAP diet and just all sorts of things. And then we wrap it up with track five, the CSI or case study immersion track. And you've got, uh, this is just a track dedicated strictly to um, case studies. And I just thought I'd throw this in here because I think that, um, you know, what a common question is related to one's um, return on investment, you know, so, so I do this, I get that I spend money, I, I, I invest and I, I get this training. And, and so what does this, what does this mean? Well, according to Zip Recruiter, functional nutrition salaries range uh, between 60 and 136K with a high of 168.5K, national average being 103. Uh, apparently working in private practice pays the highest and many opportunities for virtual work as well. And I can definitely attest to that. So there's a variety of different careers and um, opportunities for functional nutritionists. Certainly uh, the IFNCP credential, which is the Integrative and Functional Nutrition Certified um, Practitioner credential can lead to all sorts of opportunities here. Clinics, corporations, um, teaching, research, and obviously private practice. Um, I thought this was really interesting. We get these kinds of um, uh, requests all the time. The next few slides really speak to the fact that the IFNCP is now a really an established advanced practice credential. This is just one example of an employment opportunity that was posted by a lab that you may already know about, Vibrant America, who is looking for a nutritionist that was IFNCP certified preferred. All right, and we have a graduate directory and that's located on the website as well. And you know, you, you'll, when you scroll down, you'll see a section where you can type in the zip code or the state or even a, uh, the country to find the IFNAGRAD. And it's really a place where many of our prospective healthcare physicians, groups, clients find our graduates here. And we feel that it's really created a lot more perceived value for the IFNCP. <clears throat> so uh, if you're an RD and you want to display your credentials on, pro on the profile page with CDR, and for those of you who are not RDs, you wouldn't know about this, but if you are, the IFNCP is listed as an option which creates validity and legitimacy to other prospective students who are creating or, excuse me, considering um, the credential, especially when they see that the IFNCP is listed as an option on the Commission on Dietetic uh, Registrations page. This is just a screenshot of a guide to integrative healthcare credentials and certifications. 
Uh, it was published by the um, Integrative Practitioner, which is an interdisciplinary community for integrative practitioners across a wide spectrum of professions and organizations. And the IFNCP is listed in the guidebook, which we think really demonstrates the strong presence of the credential in a variety of settings, right? People are buying a reputation, not just a course. And again, it really speaks to the fact that the IFNCP is now an advanced practice credential. All right, this is the IFNA map, which is also located on the website, just shows you where IFNA has reached internationally. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a growing program. And these are just some testimonials. You can read about what some, of, um, some others are saying. Uh, uh, Sarah Ferreira, the, um, the Cleveland Clinic manager of uh, the Department of Clinical Nutrition, um, offered a beautiful testimonial, which we were very grateful for. So you can read a little bit about what others are saying. Um, and this is just really what it all leads up to, the uh, IFNCP advanced practice credential right here. So uh, you've got three pathways. You can do just the certification, which means that you go through the training, but you don't take the exam and you'll receive a certificate. Um, but if you opt in the exam, the, uh, the peer reviewed exam and pass that exam, you'll earn the IFNCP credential. So hopefully you understand the difference between those two. And minimally, you don't have to do either one of them. You, if, you just, if you're just looking for continuing education credits, we've, uh, we offer more than uh, 120 CEUs as well. So tons to choose from. All right. And to wrap this up, we have a special promo code for you. If not 15% RH, get 15% off track one. You can even combine it with your membership coupon that you get when you become a member. So get an additional 10% off. Okay, so by all means, feel free to take, an advantage, take advantage of that. And if you have questions, feel free to email us at info at IFN Academy dot com. All right. And so uh, feel free to social us on follow us on social media. <laughs> that was a tongue twister. So with that, I just want to thank you guys. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your kind attention. And uh, as a token of our appreciation, by all means, go online, go to the website, download the free gift. It's a gorgeous uh, flip book, a six food elimination flip book. It includes a seven day menu plan, references, resources. You'll love it. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take some questions. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dean. What an amazing presentation today. So as mentioned, we have a, a short Q&A here and we'll start with some questions that we've we've received. So the first one is, you said we should prioritize supplement recommendations, but how would you go about doing that? Yeah, yeah, I did. Thank you for that question. So um, we get kind of excited about recommending supplements when we're learning about functional and nutrition, and we don't want to overwhelm our patient. We don't want to throw too many supplements at a person at one time, especially if they're really not ready for it. So I, for me, um, I really feel that the best way to go about it is to run the labs, run the labs. And if you're not familiar with the labs, contact the companies, co get in touch with the reps, let them educate you, go online. Rupa Health is a, one, a, one wonderful resource because you can, you then don't have to, you know, you, you can order a lot of different labs in one spot right? Run the labs, because if you're not running the labs, you're guessing, you're guessing, oh, maybe you need a little magnesium. Hey, let's try this. Well, maybe you need a B complex, try this. And, you know, it's just, I mean, you, that is one approach, but I think uh, uh, a really, um, a more, a more accurate, personalized way to go about um, customizing your approach and prioritizing what's important is to run the labs. Great, great. Thank you for that answer. All right, moving on to the next one is, do I have to register for all five IFNA tracks at once or can I register for one track at a time? So can you do one module or all of them? So that's a good question. I wanna differentiate that we've got 33 modules 
divided into five tracks. And what I showed you earlier, um, hang on one second here. What I showed you earlier was the five different tracks. And so when you go online, you can purchase one track at a time, uh, but the modules are not sold separately. So to answer the question, the original question, you don't have to buy all five tracks at one time. You can, you can uh, invest in track one, which will get you these, for example, these six modules. And when you're ready, you can then move on to track two. And then that'll get you these nine modules. So the modules are not sold separately, but I will tell you this, you have, uh, most students are able to get through all of this in about nine months to a year, right? There's 33 of them, but we give you up to two years max. So it, it, it's like a, it's, it's a, it's a very comprehensive, cohesive program. So one track at a time, or you can even buy one or two at a time. Perfect. Thank you for that. Let's see if we have time for just a couple more questions. And you actually just sort of answered the next one, which is how long is the IFN training? Yeah, IFNA, we we like to call it IFNA for short. I mean, listen, guys, it's 33 modules. If you were to do, and it's self-paced, right? It's online and it's, and it's self-paced. So if you were to do one module a week, that's 33 weeks, right? That takes you between eight and nine months. But let's just say you need to take a little time off. You're really busy this month. You've got up to two years, uh, which is the absolute max. And then you've got a couple months to study for your exam and take the exam if you opt in the credential route. If you only want, if you just want to do the tracks, but you don't want to take an exam, you just want a certification, but you don't get the credential, you can do that too. So um, about nine months to a year. Perfect, perfect. And last question here, just for time, you mentioned some of those functional medicine tests in the presentation that you went over. Can yeah. you find those on Rupa Health? Yeah, I'm. I, you, most of a lot of these labs, and Anthony, you can help me answer these questions. I mean, I know when um, when I've needed to order. Um, let's go back here. Uh, you know, there's. A, I mean, Rupa Health continues to expand the um, the labs that you can order. Um, can, maybe you can jump in and, and comment a little bit more about that. Absolutely, and just to chime in on that, yes, you can order all of the tests that Dr. Dean went over today, as well as uh, more from over twenty different specialty labs saving a lot of time and uh, efficiency for your practice. So absolutely, these are some great tests that you went over today, Dr. Dean. And, and I'll, I'll just, just a moment, like for example, you know, a patient comes in and you're trying to figure out what kind of food plan to put them on, but you know, you might need to run some type of food sensitivity panel. And you know, because how would you know, unless you ran it, you know, what foods this patient's gonna have a problem with? Now you don't have, absolutely have to, but it's, I'm just saying that it's, it's it's, it's um, definitely a preferred way. If the patient doesn't consent to it, then you're going to have to do some guesswork. But if you, if, you can, if you can get your patient to consent to the labs, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really speed up the process and get some results much more quickly. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. So, all right, everybody, just for timing, we're going to wrap this up. And thank you for attending this live class today. Big shout out to the Integrative and Functional Nutrition Academy and Dr. Sheila Dean, who did an amazing job. And we hope to see you on the next one. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you.